Hey guys, Tom Davis here, America's Canine Educator. Thank you so much for joining me. If you're here, uh, go ahead and like this video and let me know you're here. And today we have some really good questions that I got from you guys on my last video. Um, some really good ones. And as you guys know, we are in the we're in upstate New York. Can you turn that light on? Um, coronavirus is in full effect, so. Um, not much to do, but talk about dogs for me here on the channel. So I'm going to be going over three important things today. Uh, the first thing is, is the fear of children. So dogs who are afraid of kids are typically, um, it, it really just depends on the breed. It depends on the age. It depends on, on when you get the dog, if you've had the dog since a puppy or not. Um, but I, this question on the community post was, my dog is afraid of children. My dog hides from children. Um, tell you're in the mirror, just so you know. Um, my dog hides from children. My dog um, doesn't like to be around kids. So if your dog is fearful of kids, a couple things to, to consider and to keep in mind that um, kids to dogs, if they're not used to them or if they haven't seen them before, can be a very different thing. So it could be a very different animal. Um, they could be very afraid of these small individual people who move really fast and are high pitched in their voice. And so you have to consider how much exposure your dog has with, um, with uh, kids in general. Um, and then from there, the best thing to do to help your dog get over the fear of kids is basically uh, desensitization within um, a controlled environment, which would mean not putting your child or not putting your dog into a situation that really uh, scares, hello guys, I see you all saying hello, 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 um, but not putting your child in a, or in your dog in a situation that is gonna set your dog up for failure and the kid up for failure as well. So if you can get around uh, a group of, of really anything, it doesn't. It doesn't really have. It doesn't really matter if your dog is is afraid of humans or other people or kids or grownups or not. Um, but getting them into an environment that allows you to be successful is is really uh, the key to making this this situation better. Which means not letting uh, people come. Not letting make things worse. So people coming up to run up to your dog. Um, kids running up, you know, having a controlled group to say like, okay, this is going to be a good environment for my dog to get better at. Um, so just making sure that you're picking the people that are around your dog um, uh, properly and also making sure that your dog is is under control because I think that that also has a really good, really good uh, play into all of this. If your dog is a little bit nervous and your obedience isn't that good, then putting them around any environment is not going to make them be successful or help them be successful. Um, so that's that's one thing. The other thing I would consider is if you've adopted a new dog and they've never seen kids, it could be a very, just like with humans, I mean, imagine if we've never seen kids ever, uh, ever. Just imagine as the human being never seen kids and then all of a sudden you see this little person it's like a kid, they kind of are like a human, they kind of look like a human, but they're smaller, their face is a little different, they have shorter legs. I mean, it could be very different for them. So make sure that if you do adopt a dog um, and, and they've never been exposed to children, that you do it slowly. <clears throat> also, I would ask anybody that's here, we have about 70 people in climbing that are in here. If you guys could do me a favor and just hit the like button so I know you guys are watching and you're here. Um, but I would say just giving it time and, and, and having, having, having enough time for your dog to be socialized properly with children and having enough time for your dog to be around kids, uh, that's gonna, that's gonna help them out to be successful. Um, thank you, Andrew, for liking and subscribing. I appreciate you, brother. Um, we're going to move on to the next subject and then we're going to answer some questions in the comments below. And again, if you guys are new here, hello, um, leave your questions in the comments below at the end of this video and I'll be sure to answer them uh, as they come in. And as well, if you guys are just getting here, don't forget to like this video. Um, so the next thing is, this is huge. I've been wanting to cover this for actually a pretty long time, um, which is going to be the implied stay. So this is something that a lot of dog trainers uh, have given me crap about. Um, even dog owners have given me crap about. 
and by crap I mean they're like what what why don't you why don't you do this versus versus not do this um, and just so you guys know I'm on my corded uh, headphones today because yesterday I felt like I was I was rewatching that video and I was just kind of too far away from you guys so I, I got this so I can move my mic closer um, but the implied stay so I'm gonna explain what that is for those of you who don't know what it is yet the implied stay is very simple it's basically when you tell a dog to place or sit or down it basically is then implying that stay is implied after which means you don't want them to move until you ask them to do something else. You're implying that when you say sit is sit, down is down, place is place, right? Which makes sense, which makes sense. And I'm gonna get into this a little bit because this is a huge topic and I've always wanted to cover this. And somebody asked this in the community post, which I was really excited about because it reminded me that I wanted to talk about this. So that's what the implied uh, implied commands mean, which means if you say something, that means like why would you have to say stay after you've asked the dog to do it. Now, here's my, and again, my way isn't the only way. I'm just gonna give you my opinion and my experience was experiences working with as many dogs and as many dogs owners as I have in the past. So when I, I wrote some notes on my board over here so I, so I can give you guys the, 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 the best advice I could, I could give you. Uh, and also, yes, Avery, thank you. If you guys are here, uh, like this video, let me know you're here. Um, but the implied stay, okay, so for me, it really has to do with my clients already doing the stay or doing the wait, if you will. It doesn't really matter. They're both the same thing. But really, that's what it that's what it means to me is when dog owners come in, they've already introduced the stay to the dog. They've already started it. They've already tried it or the wait. And so for me, I, you know, like, yes, I'm an educator and we have the Upstate Canine Academy and my job is to help people understand to be a better dog owner. But at the same exact time, I do my best to try to roll with some of the punches to not give them too much confusion, dog owners that is, not to give them too much confusion of, hey, dude, because they're already in there and I'm already giving them boom, 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 boom. And I'm already giving them a lot of information and they're and they're taking that all in. So when I when I start talking about the stays and stuff, they get really confused. They're like, they've never heard that in their whole life. What's an implied? So a lot of times I don't do implied stays simply because my dog owners that I'm working with have already have already been doing that with their past dogs and it's really hard for that habit to 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 break. So that's the that's the first I wouldn't say the main reason but that's the first reason why I try not to do implied with dogs that are a little bit older, less than a puppy and also dog owners who already say it. And hello, everybody. Again, I'm Tom Davis. If you guys are new, uh, go ahead and hit that that thumbs up button right in the right in the top thing, and let me know you guys are here. And then at the end of this, we're going to take some Q and A's live as well. And so, as far as the implied stay goes, that's that's one of the biggest issues that I have with with talking about the stays is people are already doing it. Now, the second thing is, and here's the big reason why I don't do implied stays with my dogs. And this is an interesting conversation, and I don't think there's a wrong or right thing. I think it's just preference of how you train. But the reason why I don't do implied sit and stays is because when I travel with my dogs, I like to be able to tell them to stay in the vehicle when I open the doors. Then you can say, well, why is your dogs rushing out the, the vehicle anyway? That's, that's, that doesn't really happen. It's just if I open my door and my dog's waiting to go out, I can then tell them to stay where they're at without asking them to do anything else. Which means if you ask a dog to, if you teach a dog implied sits and stays, which would mean they only stay when you give them a behavior, right? So if you tell them to down or sit or place, that is implied that they have to stay in that location, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that, that's great. But the problem is for me when I'm teaching my dogs is when I open a door and there are three or four dogs in there at a time, I don't want to necessarily have to ask my dogs all to sit and down in order for them to stay. So I like having the stay command because it allows me to get my dogs to stay in one spot. And it allows me to just tell them safely to say, hey, I don't care what the heck you guys are doing. I'm going to open the doors. You guys all have to stay in there, run around the truck if you want. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. <clears throat> so for me, that's why... You know, over time, I had I had some colleagues of mine say like, I don't understand why you don't just do implied stuff. I get it. it has it? There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But 
I started thinking about it and I started realizing that, well, if I do the implied stuff, then if I open my, my dogs don't run out the door, but if I'm, if I'm doing, if I'm in the, when I travel and stuff and I have my dogs and I'm in the middle of nowhere at a big rest stop with thousands of cars passing every minute, Hundreds probably more, um, but you get the idea. And then I just want them to stay. Like if I'm in the back of my truck and all my doors are open because of whatever reason, having that stay command is really great because it allows me to just tell them like, hey, do whatever you want, but stay. So that's a really great question. And there's, I don't think that in my opinion, there's no wrong or right way to say like, should you tell your dog to stay? But at the end of the day, that's why I don't do stays because of that reason is because Again, if you want, like, even if you open your door to go outside, sliding glass door, front door, back door, any door, no matter like where you're at, and you, you, you're not really in a situation. Like, if you're in a crowded area, right? And and again, like, if you would say, "Well, your obedience should be perfect," like, blah blah blah. Yeah, but there's a lot of dogs that the, the way that I train. See, that's the thing about me is I'm not a competitive dog training. Um, <clears throat> obedience person. I'm training for real life dog owners that have problems with their dogs that want their dog safe and want them to have a great relationship with them. And that's what I train for. And that's the advice I give for. Now, if you talk to somebody that's in a competitive obedience world, this would all be different. That's not me. I'm talking to people out there that are just regular dog owners that have problems with their dogs. And that implied stay can be kind of conflicting when you're out. There's a bunch of people around, say you're at a beer garden, you're at a coffee shop or something, and your paper flew away and you had to go out and get it, and you're down from a distance isn't that great, and your dog gets up, and you don't really necessarily want to put them into a down and stay, or a down, and then an implied stay because they don't know it that well from a distance, or you don't want to put them into a sit because they don't know it what well, they'll they don't know it that well from a distance. I like just applying that stay, which means, dude, I know you're up. I want you to just stay right there. So having that stay is kind of like the cherry on top for safety for me. I don't, like I said before, if you, there's people who come in and even some of my other trainers, I have three full-time trainers that work um, with me. Some of them do implied stuff and we all share clients. So it's not a big deal. But I think implied's just like a style of what you like to do. And I get that question a lot. And I try to just explain to people why I don't do implied stays. And that those are, those are my reasons. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, um, if you guys are here, like this video for me really quick. I'm going to take a drink of water. And uh, there's over 100 people in here. Um, so if you guys can just hit that like button really quick. And what happens... When you hit that like button, guys, is, is it tells all the other people who are subscribed to me or all the other dog, tr dog people who are on YouTube that there's dog stuff going on here. That's, that's why I'm telling you to hit it so we can get more people in. Um, third thing for today, which is another really great uh, question that we got, which was um, the question, I don't have the questions right here because my computer's about to die, but the question was basically, um, somebody asked, hey, um, I know that you talk about not treating your dog too much, or I'm sorry, it was a puppy question, not tr treating your dog or your puppy too much. Why um, do you do that? And then also, um, how to wean away from that. So the real underlying question was, is um, this individual had been working with her puppy and she watched one of my videos and it kind of like hit with her and she said, that makes sense. And so the question is, is she's been doing treat, 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 treat. And now her dog is a little dependent or her puppy is a little dependent on that treat. And she wants to know how to move away from, Ooh, too bright. She wants to know how to move away from, um, depending on that treat and, and maybe how to, to wean off of it. And I'll explain it really simply. Again, it's a great question. Um, first thing is, is the reason I don't love to use food with every single thing that I do is simply, hey, that's your question. Yay. See, I told you I'd answer it. Um, so the reason why I don't, first of all, the reason why I don't do food every single time when I'm, when I'm doing stuff is because the dog then becomes a little dependent on it. Just like with us, like if we went to work and we got paid every single minute for doing whatever, and then all of a sudden they're like, hey, 
um, I don't have any money on me and or we can't whatever, I'm going to pay you hourly, that's, that's going to cause a riff in your relationship because the expectations have then changed. Now, when you're teaching, I use food every day when I'm training dogs, but I'm also the same person that tells people to be very careful how you use food because it's such a strong drive for dogs, a very strong drive. Like a food drive for animals is huge. So you got to be really careful how you use it because it can go, it can work against you. It can work, it can work against you pretty hard actually, because they're like this and they're so like crazy on that food that they completely check out what you're actually teaching them. It's kind of like me on a Friday night after working 12 hours and there's cold beer around. I'm not listening to anybody. I'm just ready to have a beer. <laughs> so uh, it's the same thing with dogs is you got to be careful how you uh, administrate and deliver your, your, your food because it, it, it plays a big role in your in your relationship with your dog because then they become potentially um, dependent on it, which would be the dog not downing or sitting because you don't have the food, which becomes a problem. Uh, I can't tell you how many times when people come in, I say, hey, what does your dog know? They, they say, sit, down, stay, and heal. I said, great. And they go out and they ask their dog to sit and the dog's looking at them like, what the heck's that? And then they go over and they get a piece of food and then... Um, the dog sits and it's like, okay, well, your dog only knows sit because you have the food, which is a problem. So I'm not going to get too much. I mean, I could, there's really nothing else to do here in the coronavirus, but, um, we'll talk about it maybe a little bit later, but, um, I, again, thank you guys so much for, for jumping on here and, and, and hanging out with me. Again, I plan on doing this every day, uh, because we're, we're quarantined and I want to, um, give you guys content until we're back to getting all of our clients in and filming some other stuff. But thank you guys so much for joining me. Uh, I appreciate you guys. This is fun. Um, but going back to the food discussion, what you can do is like, say you're telling a dog to down. So you go down, good down, and you're giving them food. Well, if you normally pay them with food every single time, all you have to do is simply just wean away from that food and just use your verbal. So just say, yay, good down. So usually when we're, when we're doing marker training, and you can mark with food and you can mark with a verbal, which would mean marker would mean when the dog does it, you're doing something to capture the behavior to say, that's what I want you to do. Um, so you go, yes, good, good down or whatever you're using. Gets a little confusing. Um, but you're using food to reward and then you're also using verbal. So what I suggest people is just teach them with the verbal instead of the food. So if your dog is dependent on it, if you give your dog a treat every single time, do it maybe once every three times or once every four times. And then eventually your dog just goes, hey, like this is great. Um, and then they become very excited just to hear your voice. So food is the very, very cherry, cherry, cherry on top. And the problem is, is if you use that food right in the beginning of teaching very basic stuff that your dog will probably do with a little pressure on the leash and verbal praise, you can't ever really one up that. And then your dog becomes a little lazy. They become less driven um, because they've gotten all that stuff in, in, in the past. So it's, it's a little tricky. You got to be careful how you use food because again, it's a hard drive for dogs and um, it could become very distracting. So wean away from it. Uh, with with just isolation of instead of once every time, do it once every four times, marking with your voice so the dog still is still getting motivated. Um, so anyway, um, that's that. Um, so those are the three questions, and that's what we've been doing here live. Now I want to answer some of your questions, and uh, we're probably going to do this again tomorrow. So no no worries if you guys don't get your. I just don't want to go like super 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 long on here and. Um, so anyway, all right, so let me just rewind a little bit and see what we have. Um, so Brittany asks, how to engage my dog on walks? She's a year-old collie healer mix. She's nervous, doesn't like strangers, has nipped a couple. Well, collie healer mix, um, they're very prone to, to nip people they like and who they don't like. Um, that's just in their nature because of their breed. Um, but what I would do is just try to... Um, Teach your dog either a focus command, so teaching your dog to focus on you, um, but also doing a lot of directional changes. So when you're when you're out with your dog and your dog is looking around and not paying attention to you, change direction and get your dog to make sure that they're velcroing on you, so they're paying attention to you. I do a lot of tune-ups in my session. So if I'm out with my dog and they're not paying attention to me, I'll turn and go the other way and say heel. And if they're not paying attention, they get the, the, the leash snaps and they're like whoa whoa sorry, and then they go and I keep doing that 
to get the dog's attention. The other thing is, is just making sure that you have some sort of motivation with your dog. Um, good, good boy or good girl. Um, you can use a little bit of food. You can use, a, you can use a toy. Don't forget to bring out your toys, especially with that really prey driven dog, um, because they're going to want to chase stuff. So just making sure that you're doing something for their motivation. Um, and when you're out and they're a little nervous of things, there are certain things that there are certain things that you can um, do to get your dog that's to get your dog a little less stressed about um, the areas that you're walking. But I would say just giving giving them a job is the best way to take their mind away from what's going on around them. Um, but that's what I would do. So, um, but also making sure your basics are good: heel, leave it, sit, maybe um, just to get your dog tight. Don't go out in that environment and work with your dog if you don't have basic obedience because you're probably going to fail with that. So getting your dog engaged with you, letting them on a long line, giving some food out, getting them on you. If you if you don't have an exercise to get your dog engaged with you, then you're not going to be able to do it out in public. So try to do that before and teach them like, hey, look at me. Like this is all, this is where I come. All the good stuff comes from me. And then go out and work with your dog. If you guys are new here, go ahead and hit that like button for me. I'm answering dog training questions of all the sorts here. Um, here, this just popped up. Sydney asks, I have a rescue I've had for seven years. She does great with people, but there's one person she hates. Whoa. Sorry. Hold on. You're welcome. Um, there's one person she hates a lot. I don't know why she's on guard around him. Any advice why this could be? Great question, Sydney. I deal with this a lot. Um, you know, one one thing that I find humans, uh, us, uh, that do and they do wrong is when you see an animal that's afraid of you, we automatically talk like this and we get really excited and we get down and we're like, hey, and then that that freaks them out. Just like I just probably freaked you guys out in the camera. Um, so one thing I would suggest... Who knows why he, she doesn't like him? If they don't know each other and she doesn't like him, then who really knows why that happens, right? But the most important thing is is managing your people or managing the people around your dog that makes them nervous. Just say, hey, please don't look at my dog. Ignore my dog. Um, no eye contact, no talking, and your dog will find comfort in that. If your dog's a little sketchy, it could be past um, experiences. If you've adopted your dog and they had a bad experience with an individual that maybe smells the same, looks the same, has you know the same job or whatever they could be associating that um and then uh you know that freaks them out so having that person completely ignore your dog um is the best thing to do um and then also going out and doing activities with with that person so you walk your dog and have that person walk with you guys um sometimes things don't okay she was used as a bait dog and was starved well people suck and that sucks but i'm glad you got to save her good for you sydney um but i would say um you know, it probably has to do with past. So just do the absolute best you can to associate that person with, with because, it, I mean, it, if you think about a, a bait, what type of person a bait dog is, I mean, they're living with absolute monsters. So they're going to do everything they possibly can to get that dog out. And so just, just ignore the dog completely. Go out and do exercises until you've built trust. <clears throat> Sharon asks... Um, how can I keep my healer from attacking the broom or vacuum? Well, that's a prey drive. So we, like we talked about before, your healer, uh, it, like a border collie or, or, or a blue healer or any type of those, those, those herding dogs, um, they're going to go, go after anything that moves, which is their job. And so you can't really like train them necessarily to not want to do that. Like you can't tell a fish not to swim. It's just like you can't tell a herding dog not to chase things that move. However, you can certainly work on your obedience to counter condition this behavior. A place command and a stay command uh, is something I would be working on. You're not going to be able to tell your dog like, hey, don't care about things that move because it's a herding dog. But you can certainly counter condition this type of behavior with obedience. So I would, my, my dogs do it all the time. Even when I'm snow blowing, lawn mowing, my Dutch shepherd will do that all the time. And obviously that's not safe. So I have to tell her to go lay down and she will. So working on your place command and your stay command, I would suggest. Um, this is fun. Thank you guys for hopping on here and, and joining me and, and having a good time. Um, let's see. I'm trying. This is just a lot. Um, our th okay. So uh, Meg asks, I think I'm saying that right. Our female three-year-old German Shepherd loves us, but she attacks anyone at the door. We've tried so many different things. How can we break this? 
um, so to having friends over. So this is a question a lot of people deal with. This is basic. Uh, I have first of all, I have videos on this. Um, but when 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 dogs associate something with something, it could be something on on one end of the spectrum. It could also be something on the other end of the spectrum, which means you can get keys and a leash uh, in your coat, and your dog's gonna go, okay, we're gonna go somewhere. It's the same exact thing dogs will do with bang, bang, bang on the door, ring the doorbell. It's an association. So first couple times, your dog probably had no idea what that was. But what happens is, is they start over time associating um, they start associating somebody at the other end. So they're basically alert barking. So somebody knocks on the door, they may be the nicest dog in the world, but they're gonna light up to let you know, hey, 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 you know, they're doing their job. I think you said it was a German Shepherd, um, very vocal dog. So when a dog b knocks at the end of the door, the dogs are gonna go like, hey, there's there's somebody on the other end. I have to, ch I have to investigate. You have to think about your dog as an animal. So when they're in their home, and they're doing their own thing and they're laying down and then bang, 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 they go, whoa, and they go over and they bark and it doesn't really set that person up for success um, by any means. So um, what I would suggest to do is start to desensitize the door with um, just having somebody work on it with you. Get a, get, don't be afraid to use your leash and your collar with your dog and going out and using a leash and a collar to work on leave it. But I mean, honestly, if this is a really big problem and you've tried, I think you said so many different things, then um, go to the core and say, okay, this dog is reactive. I, you need a command to let her know that she has to leave that, she has to stop that behavior. So you have to teach her what leave it is first. And then after you've taught her how to leave it, then you can start applying that to that practice. So texting um, you, each other, whoever's living with you and your family, your dog, just say, hey, I'm home, knock on the door, have your leash and your collar on your dog, they react, leave it, correction, leave it, correction. I personally would also be working on a place command because once your dog's at the door, it intensifies. Um, so putting your dog into a place downstay, like if, you're, if your place downstay is perfect, your somebody knocks on the door and your dog barks and then you tell them to like basically shut up and say hey leave it and they do you're golden but the problem is 9 9.9 .9 times out of 10 which is probably what I'm about to tell you is people don't work on counter conditioning obedience they just want the problem to go away my shepherd's barking at the door and somebody comes over and knocks on it that's very likely for that to happen. It's a very natural, primal, inherited, I'm protecting the house type of thing. So the absolute best thing to do is for you not to try to completely take that away because it's unlikely and it's unfair. I would work on, hey, thank you, leave it. They go, okay, go to your, go, you know, go to your crate, go lay down because it's not safe for that person to come in because your dog's going to be like right there revved up. So I would spend a lot of time working on your obedience to make sure that your obedience is good. Spend a week on each behavior and master them. Place, leave it, stay, all of those things. And then start working on those behaviors and practice banging on the doors, ringing the doorbell, so on and so forth. But it's not an overnight thing. Getting an animal, putting that animal into your house and expecting them to coexist and live, live by your rules is not likely. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of patience, and it takes a lot of practice. Now, one thing I find out in my profession is, is a lot of people say, well, my, my other dog, my last dog, my neighbor's dog, my mom's dog, my brother's dog, you got lucky. So I, I understand sometimes you get some lucky dogs in your life that don't care about anything and they're the best. I have one, my own, but sometimes it, you just have to practice all of those things in order for that to, to be successful. I'm going to answer a couple more. Um, if you guys haven't yet, like, hit the like button up top, um, please. <clears throat> so let's see. Um, mm, 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 mm. Can I use the, here? Ian asks, can I use the page button on the e collar as a correction for my shepherd? That's a fantastic question, Ian. Um, as you guys know, I've partnered up with my friends over at Dogtra this year, and um, Dogtra and I are doing some really exciting things. So, for those of you who don't know what a remote collar is, it's very simply uh, no, it's not a shock collar. Can it hurt your dog? Sure, if you want it to, 
but when we train on remote collars, it is a very low level to get your dog's attention from a distance to make sure that you can responsibly uh, recall and communicate with your dog. That's what we're talking about when we talk about remote collars. Um, when I get my remote collar out, my dog goes crazy. They get so excited because I actually ran with my dog earlier um, with the remote collar uh, with no leash because of the remote collar abilities. So um, very good question. Can you correct your dog with the pager? For those of you who don't know what a pager is, it's a vibrating session on, or I'm sorry, it's a vibrating, um, it's a vibrating setting on a, on a remote collar. You absolutely can use that pager as, as a correction. Um, you just have to be careful. What I would suggest is not just getting the pager or getting the remote collar, putting it on the dog and using it. I like to just use the remote collar in a lot of other different ways to make sure that it's not aversive, it's not corrective. Your dog gets excited when they see it because they know they're going outside, they know they're going off leash, they know that they're working, food will be involved, and so on and so forth. So to answer your question, I would say making sure that you have a really good relationship with the dog, with the remote collar, on the low-level stimulations first before you use the remote in any way as an aversive. Good question, Ian. Um, Okay, uh, let's see. Amy asks, please help me. I have a pit bull that around six years old is very reactive and fearful of people and dogs. I'm pretty sure she has anxiety and can't hardly get her back on a walk. She is dragging me in. Um, it's really hard to say with that information. Um, I would say, um, Hunter, the, the, the e-collar that you're talking about is this good collar. Yep. Um, but going back to what you were saying uh, about your dog being fearful, um, if there was a traumatic experience, whether you know it or not, um, it's going to take a little bit of time. One thing that I would suggest is making sure that you're using a collar that allows you to motivate your dog to move forward and you can use your motivation or I'm sorry, your momentum to move the dog forward as well. So a lot of times when you get a dog that does not want to go anywhere and you sit there and have that conversation with a harness or a flat collar, you're gonna go nowhere and the dog is gonna win. So what I always suggest to people is make sure you can literally get your dog to move forward. Don't have that conversation with them. Don't turn and say, hey, um, why don't we go on this way? I think it's gonna be great over here. It's not a good idea. You don't wanna have that conversation. You literally just turn and go and move with your dog. If you don't have a collar, a martingale <clears throat> is the very least of of what I would do. Um, a martingale is, is just a collar. Hey, Taylor, can you let Lakota out for a second? Um, I'll show you what a martingale collar is, um, but making sure that you have just some... Koda, come here. I'll show you what a... Koda, come here. She's so sick of like... She, and she does my onlines with me. Come here. So a martingale is a collar like this. So it has just a little buckle, and then you're allowed to pull it. So... It, it, it creates some sort of uh, pressure on the dog. So it's just a normal flat collar with a little, let's take this off, bye-bye. It's a normal flat collar like this and it has a little pulley system like this. So it apply, it's the least you can do. You can Amazon it right now, Martingale collar for my dog um, and it allows you to put pressure on your dog. And going out and just moving, good boy, good girl, good boy, and just chugging along and chugging along and chugging along and getting furthest away from your dog or from your house and just sit there and just relax and have a picnic and hang out, play on your phone, do whatever, and just start that association. But if your dog shuts down and you have no leverage and you can't move forward, your dog is training you. So the fear becomes more of a, hey, I'm not gonna, um, you know, I'm not gonna work. All right, um, I'll take a couple more. Um, Diana asked, hey Tom, my dog is reacted towards other dogs. I'm trying to socialize her more. Would you recommend taking her to a dog park with a muzzle? Nope, I think that would make things a lot worse. Um, dog parks are, it's gonna, no, don't do that. <laughs> uh, it would make things a lot worse. So when your dog is fearful of other dogs, you gotta, you gotta really take a look at the situation. They're very skeptical. They're like, I don't know about this. And then you throw them in a situation with boom, all these other dogs coming from all over the place, very overwhelming. They can become very vulnerable. If you put a muzzle on them and they get attacked, which happens every single day in a dog park, it's going to really set them up for, um, not, not good, not good. Um, I would be getting, I would find yourself a group class um, trainer that has group classes that you can get around other dogs that are uh, moderately uh, trained or halfway trained that you can you can get around dogs that are calm because you because think about it if you're afraid of something say you're afraid of um, let's say you're afraid of flying right 
and you get up there and your flight's like this, you know, and it's just a bad flight. You're going to hate that flight because it wasn't, it wasn't good. It wasn't a good experience. You're not going to like it anymore. But if you get up there and you're smooth sailing, boom, you're like, hey, it's not so bad. Get around dogs that are going to respect your dog's boundaries, understand body language cues, um, and, and so on and so forth. So no, I would not bring your dog to the dog park to socialize if they're fearful. It's going to make things worse. Get around dogs that are calm, neutral, um, and just take your time with it and uh, go from there. Um, <clears throat> Matt, the dog trainer. Hello, Matt. How are you, man? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a prior Air Force dog handler trainer. Can you recommend additional so psychology recommendations, education, a good book? It's a good question. I get this question all the time. I really don't have a lot of books. I'm really like bad at reading. Not bad at reading, but I just don't, it doesn't register with me that well. A lot of people can read and register it and understand. I'm a hands-on person. The, the most I can tell you is hands-on. That's how I learned. That's how I, that's how I got to where I'm at is just working hands-on with as many uh, dogs as I possibly can and, and making sure that you're, you're training with somebody who, who um, does behavior. Um, because if you're going to do basic obedience and puppy stuff, you're not going to see a ton of different behaviors. You're going to see very adolescent uh, similar behaviors and, and that may not be a value to you. Um, all right, if everyone here right now just likes this video really quick, I'm going to answer two more questions. Okay, yep, 132 likes, 126 people watching. You guys are the best. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to answer two more questions, and then we will do this again tomorrow. If you guys haven't yet, don't forget, uh, subscribe to my channel, turn on your notification bell, and I'll see you guys tomorrow after these last two questions. Okay, uh, here we go. Yeah, Matt, no, no worries, brother. Uh, yeah, just, just get out there and... I mean, maybe just ask another trainer who does well with books. Um, I just, it's not my thing and I don't want to act like it is. It's just not, I'm not, I, I can't. Uh, I can, but I can't. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's go. Let, what questions do we have here? You're the coolest, you're the best. You guys are the best. Thank you so much. How to train a deaf dog? Hmm, that's a good question, Christina. Um, to train a deaf dog, what I have found the most successful way, and this could be out of your comfort zone, this could be out of your um, whatever, but the best way that I've successfully trained a dog um, has been the remote collar. And uh, that tells you how much the remote collar varies in the user and how you use it. I train, I've trained six month old um, deaf dogs on the remote collar beautifully beautifully recall sit stay etc so basically what i would do he's 10 years and he has lumps <laughs> okay so he's deaf because he's older um well if you're trying to teach new behaviors it may be a little bit difficult but i would start doing hand commands for basic obedience um and that's probably the best you can do it at, at that uh moment um is just do hand commands um and you can start to get into remote collar training if you if you'd like, um, but that's that's what I would do is just try to find if it's something that you're serious about, um, it's something that you could do. Um, Seamus, uh, just do the best you can. I know it's crazy out there. It's 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 really bad. Um, it's really bad. All right, let's see. I'm gonna answer this this one here. So Tina asked. That's a cool way to spay Tina, if I'm saying that right. Um, <clears throat> is it fair to muzzle my dog? Taylor, do you think Tina, T-E-E-N-A? That's cool. Is it fair? I always ask Taylor these questions. She's usually pretty good about it. Is it fair to muzzle my dog while introducing him to my mom's new puppy? He is very reactive when it comes to dog. I'm nervous. This is a great question. How to introduce a dog that's reactive to a new dog? Well, you have to understand that the puppy, if, it, if the puppy has come from a litter and your dog is literally like playing with a bunch of other dogs, so excited, they look at your, the, the reactive dog, your, your mom's dog's gonna look at your dog and go, hey, you're just a bigger whatever, and he's gonna come running up, and he's gonna be like, yay, let's play, and boom, there could be like some sort of attack, so you gotta be, you gotta be really, I'll answer that in a minute, Trish, you gotta be really careful how you do that. The best way to do it is, I have a video on this that we did live. It's not like the best quality because it's, it's live and outside and you can't really hear me that well, but 
The best way to introduce a new dog safely, um, a couple things, is using a chain link fence so you can bring them up on a leash. But the most important thing is, is don't give them a lot of pressure. So if you bring them up and you're tight on that leash, it's going to create a lot of conflict. It's going to create a lot of frustration. So when you're doing this, make sure that if you're going up to a chain link fence, letting them sniff each other and seeing what happens. Um, that's the safest way to do it. The other thing you can do is simply go out <clears throat> and go for a walk and literally just walk around with your dog um, and the other dog, not letting them interact, not letting them sniff and see how things go off of your property. Do not let the dogs on your property inside the house immediately um, to, to do that. It's going to create a lot of problems. Um, but so going out, going for a walk, using fences, using gates to have them meet and, and play it by ear. Your question was, is can you muzzle your dog? Absolutely. If it's a puppy and your dog is only going to be like a sweet little like, hey, I'm a cute little puppy and, and there's no malicious intent, and no no worries and, and whatever to the other dog, you can, but I wouldn't do it at first because it could make the situation sour. Um, so just be really careful how you do it. I would do it at the end. I would put the muzzle on at the end if you're going to let them in the house and, and in the yard and play with each other. Um, so walks. Fences and gates, then the muzzle. That's totally fine. So, hey, guys, um, I'm going to head off. I've been here for 40 minutes. Thank you guys so much for joining me. If you haven't yet, don't forget, like, subscribe to my channel. If you're watching this video later on, um, what we're going to do is this. Leave your comments in the comments below on this video. So, when I, so if you guys have already asked your questions, when I post this live, there's not going to be any questions on the video, so you have to go and re-ask them. So you guys ask your questions in this comments in the in the video after this I get off, and I will answer those. I'll pick those questions for tomorrow, and then I'll see you guys here tomorrow. This is so fun. Thank you guys so so much for hopping on here. It makes time go by while we're in the coronavirus, um, whatever. Um, if you guys have any room possible dogs and shelters are being euthanized because people aren't allowed to go to the shelters to take care of them if you guys reach out to your local shelters to see if they need help if you guys have room to foster and you have the ability to foster um do so because dogs are unfortunately going to be wiped out of shelters um because nobody's going to be legally allowed to go there as this thing kind of progresses it's very sad hurts my stomach um there's nothing i can do because um, I'm full here and then we can't go to the facility really to to do that So if you guys uh, haven't yet reach out to your shelters and see what they need um, Rescue see what they need and just do the best you can to advocate for those dogs who don't have a voice I will talk to you guys tomorrow. Mwah. Thank you so much